very good morning to all of you and good afternoon and good evening to all others for joining from rest part of the world today our guest speaker for the day is dr austin g kula sekararaj from london uk and he is going to lecture us on an update on aplastic anemia non transplant management this webinar is brought to you by mumbai hematology group supported by bsv bringing life to life and managed by perfect square i thank dr saswata banerji and team bsv mr yash mr kalpesh and the team perfect square executive committee of mumbai hematology group our chief guest for the day dr nitin gupta from delhi our guest speaker for the day dr austin kula sekararaj from london uk all over the discussions who are themselves very eminent hematologist and hematology oncologist and you participants for spending a sunday morning afternoon and evening i will stop over here and give you a glimpse of our next weekend 47th annual conference mumbai hematology group meeting and essence of ash december 2023 with our 10 international guest speakers to have a view this cme is from friday to sunday 26 to 28th of january 2024 the venue will be at learning galaxy 8th floor urmi estate iconic wing a 95 ganpat rao kadam mark opposite peninsula business park lower parl west mumbai so if anybody is not registered for the event and would like to join for the event please register for this event this will be from 26 january to 28 january 2024 47th annual conference of mumbai hematology group and essence of ash december 2023 well let me give you a flavor of our next weekend activities next saturday that is 3rd of february from 7 pm onwards indian standard time onwards we have webinar on Sorry. acute myeloblastic leukemia integrating mrd in clinical decision making in relation to lo stem cell transplant and maintenance decisions by our guest speaker dr navel devar from md anderson cancer center houston texas usa and the following day that is sunday 4th of february 2022 from from 11:30 am indian standard time onwards We have webinar on sound bites from Ash two zero two three by our guest speaker Dr. Vishal Jayakar from King's College London, Imperial College London. Now it's time to introduce our discussions for the from for the day, and here it is put in alphabetical order. To start with, we have Dr. Akash Khandelwal from Sarvodaya Hospital, Faridabad, Haryana. Dr. Amrita Saraf from Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi. Dr. Ankit Rayani from Cure Hematology Oncology Clinic, Ahmedabad. Dr. Dinusha Chaturani from Royal Oldham Hospital, Greater Manchester, UK. Dr. Kripa Bajaj from Basa Vatrakam Indo-American Cancer Hospital and Research Institute, Hyderabad. Dr. Kunal Chatani from Nagpur. Dr. Nidhi Jain from Zaydus Hospitals, Ahmedabad. Dr. Radhika K K from Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. Dr. Ranjit Matthew Vargis from Command Hospital, Pune. Dr. Sanjukta Rao from Saint John's Medical College Hospital, Bengaluru. Dr. Satish Kumar A from Manipal Hospital, Yashwantpur, Bengaluru. Dr. Suprakash Sanyal from Fortis Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Suma T L from H C G Hospital, Bengaluru. Dr. Tulika Shet from Ames, Delhi. Now it's a time to introduce our very special guest for the day. We have with us our chief guest for the day, Dr. Nitin Gupta from Delhi. Dr. Nitin Gupta is DM in Clinical Hematology from Ames, New Delhi. Fellowship Leukemia and BMT from Vancouver, Canada. Consultant Clinical Hematology and BMT Physician at Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi. It's our pleasure to invite him. to inaugurate our webinar and give some words of wisdom over to you dr nitin gupta uh thank you amit and um, good morning to all uh, our listeners and uh, uh, good morning dr astin again so uh, thank you mumbai hematology group for making the me the chief guest here so i could see many of our colleagues my seniors and my uh, junior colleagues out there in the discussions um my um, warm regards to all of them so um coming to uh, the hematology part so for my younger colleagues or uh, the students who 
I aspire to become a hematologist. Um, I would like to say a few uh, words about uh, the field of hematology. As we all know that uh, we are all hematologists by our choice. And of course, we love working in hematology and we enjoy working in hematology. So it is, a, of course, a good field so to choose and as a career. Uh, when I started my career way back in um, uh, 2006 in hematology in all India institutes, um, uh, I think the hematology uh, practice was very much different from uh, which is uh, today. Uh, we had very fewer therapies at that point of time. Um, and the bone marrow transplant, we were all enamored by the bone marrow transplant. Everybody, I think, who chose hematology at that time wanted to do uh, BMTs. That was the uh, the thing. And of course, that was one of the, um, uh, the reason uh, I choose hematology. And then, uh, but yes, um, going back that the therapies were limited. Leukemias, we hardly had um, other than 7 plus 3 induction, uh, uh, not many therapies. Even the myeloma had a uh, very less amount of uh, treatment at that point of time. We started uh, at the time of VAD therapy and then um, bortezomib, lenalidomide were just around the corner. Uh, similarly, for aplastic anemia, and Dr. Austin can very well uh, explain that uh, very limited therapies were available and ATG was uh, hardly available to uh, many patients in India. So uh, nowadays we are uh, lucky and I think that good for the patients that uh, so many uh, development has taken place in the field of hematology, not only from the therapeutic point of view, but yes, from the uh, understanding the disease, the biology as well. Uh, they are uh, work, uh, great amount has of work has been done in uh, molecular understanding of the disease. And uh, we are getting to the targeted therapies, novel immunotherapies. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the field has progressed a lot and, I, and it, it will continue to progress. So unless we are able to cure all of the disease. Um, Similarly, um, uh, the, the people who are aspiring for a career in hematology, it is a um, field not only for clinicians uh, uh, who can solve the one of the most difficult uh, problems in the field of medicine. So I think uh, I, everybody will agree that hematologists uh, will get the most difficult patient referrals in the hospital. So uh, that is the one part of our job that uh, we uh, are in demand, not only in our field, but yes, other people will also take our help to uh, uh, for their patient's problem. Similarly, for um, uh, the people who um, are planning a career in hematopathology, I think uh, or they have the um, area of their um expertise so which is also uh, getting a uh, wider day by day with the advent of many treatments and also oh, the modality of diagnostic with uh, sequencing and uh, uh, flow cytometry and such similarly in the patient the people who wants to teach so again the um, dr agarwal is one of the prime example and we can look upon him um, that uh, not only you do the patient care, but yes, you train other people in the hematology, become a teacher, become a mentor. So again, it is a uh, great thing to do. Similarly, I would say that um, uh, again, the, the one of the most important part of the uh, choosing a career is the job security and to learn your uh, livelihood. So um, the good part is that uh, the, uh, everybody uh, who is doing the hematology practice can earn a um, good living, can afford a good living, and uh, they can um, they can be uh, assured from that point of view. So I think a hematology is a, a great career to choose from. As a hematologist, I am very happy, and uh, my colleagues are also they are very satisfied with their job. So I would encourage the younger people uh, who are listening and who wants to take up a career in hematology, please go ahead and we all welcome you. And this field is uh, growing. It will grow further and uh, you will enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitin Gupta for sharing your thoughts on hematology on various aspects of hematology, maybe clinical hematology, hematopathology, as a teacher, as well as many other aspects of hematology so that our futures, are, our uh, students, as well as fellow residents are benefited a lot with your guidance. Thank you so much for being with us as a chief guest for the day. I now share the screen.
Now it's a time to introduce our guest speaker for the day. We are with us, Dr. Austin G. Kula Sekhararaj from London, UK. Dr. Austin is consultant hematologist at King's College Hospital, London, UK. Honorary senior clinical lecturer at King's College, London, UK. His clinical interests are MDS, aplastic anemia, perexable oxygen hemoglobinuria, other marrow failure syndromes and myeloid malignancies. He leads the King's National PNH Service. He has got many translational researches. He's a Bloodwise Foundation and British Society of Hematology Senior Clinical Research Fellow. Also, molecular and immunological pathogenesis of MDS and aplastic anemia with particular focus on overlap disorders. He is very passionate about delivery of clinical trials. His current national coordinating investigator for many phase one, two, and three clinical trials. His current drive is to bring novel therapies for aplastic anemia, PNH, TP53 mutated myeloid neoplasms, and improvement of thrombocytopenia. He's a scientific advisor for patient advocacy group, MDS UK, and member of the MDS NCRN working group. He's a member of the European Society for Blood and Marrow Transplantation Severe Aplastic Anemia Working Party, he has authored and co-authored over 100 articles in peer-reviewed journals and has contributed book chapters in major textbooks. Today he is with us and he is going to lecture us on an update on aplastic anemia non-transplant management. Well, thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Austin Kulasekara Raj. Thanks, uh, Dr. Amit Khrana. Thank you so much. And thanks for those kind words and the introduction and also to Professor Agarwal for facilitating this and also for the whole team for doing this over many, many years. And it's always a it's always a joy and a pleasure to talk to talk uh, talk to you all and to share share uh, the uh, share the experience of uh, treating these patients. So I'll try to share my screen. Can you just quickly confirm, Amit? Can you can see it and hear me? Absolutely, sir. Please proceed, sir. Thank you so much, Amit. Yeah. So I think uh, I can't remember when I gave an update to this group on aplastic anemia. I think I was just looking back. I think it was September 2021. But I had an honor and pleasure to be with you all in the last Ash update meeting. And looks like you've got a fantastic uh, lineup of speakers and programs coming up in the next couple of weeks. I'll, I'll encourage you to attend. It's always it's always good uh, good meeting other people and also learning from uh, learning from experts as well. So uh, I think my task uh, today has been to give you an update on the management of aplastic anemia. And I'll just could look at my timer. So probably got 30 to 45 minutes. Would that be right, Amit? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so uh, I will touch upon non-transplant management predominantly, but uh, obviously I cannot keep away from talking a bit about transplant because uh, the two therapeutic options in the context of aplastic anemia is uh, transplant or immunosuppressive therapy. So just to go over it, uh, I, I think understanding wise, and I, I know there are uh, uh, trainees and other other people uh, in the audience, but uh, understanding aplastic anemia is extremely easy. So we know bone marrow is the is the is the factory which produces all the all the blood cells, and they come from the stem cells, and we produce uh, produce about two million red cells every second, which is like a massive production factory. So in the context of aplastic anemia, what happens is there is an immunological insult or an autoimmune insult to the bone marrow stem cells. And that leads on to contraction of the stem cell pool. And this contraction of the stem cell pool leads on to an empty bone marrow. And as we know, contraction of stem cell pool means that you get significant uh, cytopenia. And this is uh, what we are talking about, the one in the middle, which is the immune-mediated bone marrow failure. And this also is in the context of us making sure that other 
cited toxic drug induced or radiation or the toxicity induced suppression of the bone marrow has been ruled out. And this is quite important in countries like India and also in other Far East where uh, unknown toxic exposure uh, in the context of number of different agents could induce uh, sometimes a transient marrow suppression, but also sometimes a permanent marrow suppression as well. And we'll talk about the 10% of patients who do have germline uh, 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 bone marrow failure uh, syndromes, i.e. constitutional uh, genetic defects. But it's also important to note that in the context of this stem cell contraction, there could also be uh, PNH stem cells, which, which people believe could, uh, could be carried by uh, every individual, but they seem to be resistant to the uh, immunological attack on the bone marrow. And thereby, these uh, PNH stem cells can expand, leading on to uh, PNH hemopoiesis or expansion of the PNH cells, which can lead on to hemolysis and thrombosis. So, to say that aplastic anemia and PNH is uh, extremely linked with each other is an understatement because it's a continuum mm -hmm. of process where uh, patients can have a PNH clone in about 60% of patients with aplastic anemia on a snapshot, but patients without a PNH clone can evolve over a period of time as well. And patients who have hemolytic PNH can also go on to develop bone marrow failure and that is uh, directly correlated with cytopenia and hemolysis, but it's never easy to differentiate because you can have patients sitting in the middle, uh, middle as well. And that is probably one of the uh, things which we can use to ascertain which bit of the bone marrow condition needs to be treated, i.e., the aplastic anemia side of things or the hemolytic aspect of it. And that depends upon the symptomatology, the size of the PNH clone, the degree of the hemolysis, because you do see even in the context of aplastic anemia, you can have 80 to 90% PNH clone, but they will be significantly thrombocytopenic. They might not have hemolysis and there is little benefit with anti-complement therapy in that scenario. So, I did tell you that this is a disease where there is immune dysregulation and immune dysfunction where the stem cells are being uh, are being attacked by the uh, unknown uh, immune trigger which uh, stimulates dysregulated immune system and predominantly with the CD8 cytotoxic T cells which is attacking the hemopoietic stem cells leading on to apoptosis but the cytokines involved in this process, namely interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, is also extremely important. And as we showed nearly now 10 years back, that the role of CD4 T cells, especially the T regulatory cells, are extremely important in, in, uh, in uh, triggering this as well, and also can help to uh, differentiate from patients who might respond or not respond to immunosuppressive therapy. Secondly, we want to make sure that these patients who present with pancytopenia don't have inherited bone marrow failure syndromes. And this is one thing I think has uh, gone leaps and bounds in the last uh, uh, 10 to 15 years with the number of genes which have been implicated in the uh, cause of a genetic bone marrow failure syndrome having expanded significantly from what initially was described in the context of Turk and Turt down to newer genes. And you probably see at least <clears throat> one new gene being described every, every month now, indicating that we are still to totally uh, delineate this group of patients. And, uh, and it's important because this is something I've seen has significantly improved with the better availability of uh, ability and availability to do genetic testing, especially in India, because I see sometimes uh, reports where uh, predominantly from Medgenomics, but also from other centers where you are able to get these inherited bone marrow failure genes uh, reported within a sh within an extremely short turnaround period as well. That helps to aid in the management of these uh, of these patients over uh, over a period of time. 
And some of these genetic syndromes, as I described, have got some age predilection as well from having SAMD9, SAMD9L predominantly in the young, young years and teenage years down to DDX41, which is predominantly in the ages of 70 and 80. So that's something we need to be 100% sure when a bone marrow is hypocellular, you need to make sure that is there an acquired aplastic anemia or not, because the therapeutic modalities are different between immune mediated and acquired aplastic anemia. But just the last slide on this uh, inherited bone marrow failures. Although we are now aware of a number of genes which has been associated with inherited bone marrow failure syndromes, unfortunately, we still have around 40% of cases where you're pretty confident that there is an inherited bone marrow failure syndrome, but we haven't been able to uh, delineate the actual genetic cause of this uh, condition. So, so we know now that in the context of a hypocellular bone marrow, it's important to make sure that uh, you get to the diagnosis of aplastic anemia. And interestingly enough, as you, as you know, aplastic anemia is not a diagnosis of saying that you find certain abnormalities and this is aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia is still a diagnosis of exclusion because you want to exclude infiltrative conditions, you want to exclude other triggers, you want to exclude uh, exclude uh, fibrosis, you want to exclude dysplasia, and uh, uh, that is how you come to the diagnosis of aplastic anemia. And the severity of the aplastic anemia is still defined based on the Kamita criteria back in 1976. So that stood the test of the time. So it's nearly coming up to 50 years uh, since uh, since this criteria was used. And uh, we uh, we talk about non-severe aplastic anemia, and I'll talk a, a few things on the treatment of this because we put together a large data set which was published in leukemia uh, uh, last year. So it's important to diagnose first, then based on the definition, then you need to categorize them based on the severity, uh, severity of the disease, and then uh, and then take towards the treatment of it. These are some of the terminologies which was used for aplastic anemia in the past, and uh, as you can see, they were they were called in a different types of uh, manner in the in in the past. So whenever we look at patients with aplastic anemia. We are extremely careful to rule out if they have any previous blood counts, if they have any fibrosis, any increased predilection of cancers, consanguinity, a number of other things as well, because they can aid us in delineating immune mediated from inherited bone marrow failures. And we do a, a, a a plethora of tests to number one to diagnose, number two to stratify, and number two to number three to uh, de define the severity of the disease, but also to rule out inherited and acquired, and also to check for whether these patients are eligible for treatment because uh, we need to be careful about these patients getting uh, bleeding symptoms. So it's important that they have adequate supply of platelet platelets given and also HLA antibody screen because there are a number of patients who develop uh, HLA antibodies and HPA antibodies that uh, providing them appropriate transfusions can be, uh, can be a nightmare predominantly during ATG when we are supposed to keep the platelet count at least tw above 20 into 10 to the power of 9 per liter because of the consumptive nature when ATG is given that these platelets can be mopped up easily and the patients can be at an increased risk of uh, bleeding. Uh, we all know cytogenetics uh, is very useful, but sometimes, most of the time, cytogenetics fail. But in the last five years, we've sort of gone away from doing uh, the cytogenetics because of the failure rate, and we use SNPRA karyotyping for various other reasons because that helps to identify other things, including loss of heterozygosity. What about telomere length? I'm not sure whether there is any laboratories in India who routinely measure this or have confidence in measuring this. So this was a study from NIH, which was published in the later part of 2023, where they tried to use machine learning in the context of aplastic anemia, 
predominantly to differentiate between inherited and acquired aplastic anemia. And as you can see, telomere length had the highest predictive power to delineate and differentiate these two conditions. And the question is whether we can use machine learning to do other things in aplastic anemia, i.e. to predict response, to predict clonal evolution, which are extremely important. The other thing we've always wanted to differentiate was with hyperplastic myelodysplastic syndrome. And as you know, uh, this is now nearly four years back when we did the study of a large cohort of patients, both defined as hyperplastic uh, MDS and defined as aplastic anemia, 400 odd patients, where we tried to understand whether these were histological and genetic factors can be used to uh, use to delineate this, uh, differentiate between these two group of uh, diseases. And yes, we were, because if a patient has got a, um, has got a low histological and genetic score, despite them branded as hyperplastic MDS, essentially if they don't have any genetic mutations, normal cytogenetics, they don't have ring centroblast, dysplasia, or other things, they fall into this group. So essentially patients defined as hyperplastic MDS with a low score behave more like aplastic anemia, while patients who have a high uh, uh, histological and genetic score behave more like uh, a normal cellular or a hypocellular MDS, both from overall survival and also from uh, from uh, AML AML progression. So this is something we 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 try to uh, do that using this uh, scoring system. But thankfully, for the first time, WHO 2022 has now defined myelitis hyperplastic MDS as a morphologically defined entity because historically it was never defined as a specific entity and they've used the cutoff of 25% uh, cellularity. The other thing we always say is does TNH clone help to differentiate? Uh, but it seems to be that when we did the study a few years back, we the PNH clone was present in uh, both in MDS, predominantly in hyperplastic MDS and low risk MDS, as also in aplastic anemia. But this this study showed that uh, if you have an acquired loss of heterozygosity, copy neutral loss of heterozygosity in six P or a PNH clone or a clonal TCR rearrangement, they have a very good ability to uh, find out if this patient has got immune-mediated aplastic anemia or an inherited bone marrow failure. So these kind of techniques can be used to differentiate as well. Cytogenetic abnormalities, as you, as you probably very well know, is not uncommon in aplastic anemia that about 15% of patients will have cytogenetic abnormalities, including trisomy 8 or 6P LOH, which is the locus of the HLA gene, or DEL13Q, which occurs in close correlation with the PNH clone as well. So indicating that cytogenetic abnormalities can be seen in the context of aplastic anemia. And this is a very old data looking at sniffer abnormalities in the context of aplastic anemia and how they can be how they can be used uh, in a clinical setting. Lastly, we always talk about clonal hemopoiesis, and uh, one thing to say is that clonal hemopoiesis is extremely common in aplastic anemia, depending upon the technique you use, the sensitivity you use, and the type of abnormalities you include. So you can have a pig a mutation or a PNH clone, cytogenetic abnormalities, 6P loss of heterozygosity mutations, indicating that two-thirds of the patients with aplastic anemia will have a degree of clonal hemopoiesis as indicated there. The other thing we need to be careful about is this uh, concept of mutations in aplastic anemia. So here in this uh, large NIH study, they found that uh, predominantly these mutations were at a low level at diagnosis and expanded at six months post-treatment. So they were less than the 10% uh, variant allele frequency. And when we looked at uh, our data in the context of race study as well, most of these mutations had a low variant allele uh, frequency 
And uh, predominantly, these mutations seen in the context of aplastic anemia had less than 1% variant allele frequency. So essentially to show that uh, quite a lot of these uh, genomic abnormalities can be present at a very, very low level. This indicates more of an oligoclonal hemopoiesis rather than, rather than this means that these patients have got MDS. So it's uh, very important that you need to uh, take, uh, you need to be careful if you're doing mutational screening in aplastic anemia. And it's also that immunosuppressive therapy doesn't induce mutations. It's always present at a low level. And when we did the mutation screen in the context of aplastic anemia in the in the race trial which is shown here that we were able to find out that the um, frequency of mutations increased over a period of time as shown um, uh, 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 both arm a and arm b arm a is without l thrombopag and arm b is with l thrombopag i.e immunosuppressive therapy atg cyclosporin or atg cyclosporin plus uh, uh, plus l thrombopag so despite this mutations being present in 60-70% of patients, only three out of those 100 and 195 patients transformed to myelodysplastic syndrome, and only one of them had monosomy 7. And when you look at these, we see that these mutations are quite common over a period of time, essentially meaning that mutations per se isolated in the context of aplastic anemia doesn't mean MDS. And just because these patients have got some low level mutations in certain genes doesn't mean that these patients should go in for a hemopoietic stem cell transplantation. So this is one picture depicting how clonal hemopoiesis has evolved in acquired aplastic anemia over a, over a period of time and the implications of it, indicating that Yes, you can have certain um, expansion of the oligoclonal hemopoiesis in the context of this uh, depleted stem cell pool, which is under a proliferative pressure, inducing uh, abnormalities which can have pure good prognosis uh, abnormalities or some, some mutations which are neutral fluctuant. But it's also important that we need to look out for things which can indicate a higher risk of going towards myelodysplastic syndrome or progression to other myeloid neoplasms. So now coming back to treatment options in the next uh, uh, next twenty to twenty five minutes, we will talk about what is uh, what is the what are the treatment options, what are the newer developments, and what are in the horizons. And as I told you, it is it is a disease where the treatment uh, options predominantly the for the severe and the very severe aplastic anemia is based upon the age of the patient. So I'm also pleased to say at this time that the new BCSH, British, British Committee of uh, British uh, Society of Hematology guidelines will be out in the next week or two in the British Journal of Hematology. And this is taken from there looking at the treatment indications. So if you have a patient less than 40, they have a HLA identical sibling donor. Yes, they would go for a transplant if they have a sibling sibling donor. If they do not, they will go into horse ATG with cyclosporin. And patients over the age of 50 will also get this treatment even if they have a sibling donor. But if they do not have a, a response in three to six months and have an unrelated donor, they will go in for a allogenic stem cell transplantation from a volunteer unrelated donor. The issue with patients less than the age of uh, between 40 and 50, if they're extremely well fit with much not lack of comorbidities and you're able to get a donor very quickly, these patients can also go into a HLA identical sibling donor. And as you probably know in children, there has been a big uh, uh, retrospective comparative data, but also an ongoing prospective trial uh, comparing uh, ATG cyclosporin uh, towards unrelated donor transplant. But as you very well know, historically, at this time point, if the donor was not there, we used to give l thrombopag and refractory aplastic anemia. But now, as you know, l thrombopag has moved up the ladder. So we use a triple drug therapy in the form of ATG cyclosporin with L-thrombopag. 
And if they do not have response, then we talk about other options as indicated in, in there as well. So this is sort of a snapshot of uh, how the newer guidelines will look. And obviously it's up for discussion that we can talk about where things fall in in countries who do not have straightforward access to horse ATG or ATGAM. And I know you use Bharat GAM and it's also been shown to have reasonably responses, but there won't be a comparative trial to look at it, but, uh, but it's again something we can discuss. So as I said, the two treatment options are always weighing up within immunosuppressive therapy and hemopoietic stem cell transplantation and certain age group, availability of certain siblings, as HLA match siblings, obviously in the first line setting, uh, transplantation is better if you have less than 40 and have a HLA compatible sibling. And there are sort of pros and cons for each of this therapy as well, because transplant has got a, a potential cure, a low risk of GVHT, depending upon the conditioning regimen and other things, while immunosuppressive therapy, obviously there is no risk of GVHT, um, but obviously there are toxicity, infections, and other things needs to be taken into equation. So this is just to give you some of the some of the conditioning regimens which are used throughout the world in the context of uh, uh, stem cell transplantation. And as you can see with the matched sibling, matched uh, uh, haploidentical donor, different uh, approaches are are being or being or being used as well. The one thing I'll always say in the context of aplastic anemia is the bone marrow stem cell sources uh, is uh, is the preferred source predominantly for ATG based regimens. Although we used peripheral blood stem cells for uh, campus based regimens, the post transplant immunosuppression is usually carried up to twelve months mostly tapered from nine months, and we keep a higher therapeutic level of cyclosporin to prevent graft rejection. And we have always used a uniform regimen in UK called FCC or fluotrab and cyclophosphamide uh, alentuzumab or CAMPATH with post-graft cyclosporin. We don't use methotrexate in this uh, in a scenario. And we also don't, we also tend to use peripheral blood stem cell. And this has been consistently used with various uh, various toxicities, uh, which is specific to this predominantly autoimmune complications and viral infections. But it is such a very, very well tolerated regimen with nearly extremely low graft versus host diseases as well. And this is a regimen which induces a mixed chimerism with CD3 uh, count being uh, uh, at a low level. We updated this. Now we've nearly done 100 transplants using this uniform regimen of uh, FCC. And as you can see, uh, a very good uh, GVHD-free, relapse-free survival over this uh, time. And uh, the th few things which impacts them, the overall survival is the HCTCI, um, which, which, which if it's high, has got a, a deleterious effect on the survival, while if you have a HCTCI of less than three, the overall survival is extremely good. What about haploidentical transplantation? As you can see, this is the haploidentical transplantation in 2005. So you can look at it uh, and see how things have evolved in the last 10, 15 years with the advent of post-transplantation cyclophosphamide. So you can look at it and say that this was uh, this was very, very dismal with uh, poor engraftment, increased uh, acute and chronic GVHT, and an impaired overall survival. But things have changed, and as you know, with the with the uh, implementation of post transplant cyclophosphamide, and this has also gone into a modification. Now there is a increase in the TBI uh, of four hundred centigrade, and also there is an ATG run in here on day minus eight and minus seven to improve this and improve the graph failure. And the John Hopkins have been leading on this with, uh, uh, so this is the regimen I was talking about with, with the implementation of ATG run-in and increased dose of TBI, uh, indicating that these patients have got a better survival. But obviously there is no comparative studies between uh, this and other regimens. So you need to take it uh, obviously with that in the back of the mind, but it is something which has significantly improved the 
prognosis of these patients. Now, uh, switching gears from transplant to immunosuppressive therapy. So we know that immunosuppression for aplastic anemia has been around since the, since the uh, pivotal study done in 1986, but has been around since the early 19, uh, 1970. Variably, responses between 60 to 70%. Relapse was seen in about 30% of patients, clonal evolution seen in 5 to 15% 15, 15 of this, this patient. So this, this is something uh, which we need to keep in the back of the mind because although it is a very good regimen, ATG cyclosporin, there are other issues including relapse and clonal evolution. And if you look at the first line therapy, and we'll talk a bit about the horse ATG with l thrombopack, which has significantly increased the response rate. But when you look at rabbit and other combinations, that's where things are. And it's also important, this is just giving you an example, but also to show that patients over the age of 60 do not do as well as patients in the ages of less than 20 or 20 to 40 do because that those group of patients have a better overall survival while survival does decrease in patients who are in the older age uh, age category and this was also updated as you can see the overall survival at 15 years was around 55 percent for this group and 32 percent for this uh, for the group over the age of 60 years so it's important to take this in, into account but it's also extremely important that patients be patients who do not respond to immunosuppressive therapy they need to be maintained on uh, treatments including prophylactic antimicrobials antifungals and other things because i think that has improved the survival of this group of patients as you can see patients in this era group two, group 3 which was within 2002 to 2008 despite them not having um response to ATG and cyclosporin, the survival is better. And this is censored for transplant. So even if you do not transplant, these patients do have a better overall survival close to 60%. And that is again depicted here because if you historically in the past, in the 90s, when you do not have response to ATG and cyclosporin, you can see a plummeting in the overall survival. But now with the context of triple drug therapy and also with predominantly due to better supportive therapy, i.e. platelets, uh, antifungals, mold active, and other things, you can see that these group of patients do well, despite them not having responded to the primary treatment. But we cannot predict which patients respond to ATG uh, because uh, we know that young patients and non-severe disease respond, and uh, there are other factors which are there, but not clearly delineated to show which patients would have a better response to uh, ATG. We try to do it using the T regulatory profile, but it's obviously not available in, uh, in all centers. So we talked about some of the complications with uh, uh, immunosuppressive therapy in first line, including uh, uh, hemolytic PNH, but also in the context of late, uh, late cancers and evolution to MDS and AML. So people have tried a number of different modalities to improve uh, with horse ATG and cyclosporin, including addition of MMF, cyrolimus, and also GCSF, but that has not led to any improvement in the response. Uh, until the l thrombopag was used in the upfront setting, so this is the data from the a uh, phase two NIH study where they used l thrombopack with cyclosporin and ATG, horse ATG, and found uh, that these patients had a better response. And as shown here, uh, if you look at all the 178 patients, you have an overall response close to 81% and a CR close to 39%. And as you, as you see, this was not seen in the historical past when the CR rate was only 20% compared to now we are reaching up to 40% in the context of triple drug uh, triple drug uh, regimen. Uh, 
Additionally, we did a phase three trial. So uh, we published this in NEJM in early part. And so I'm pleased to see my friend and colleague, Regis Pipal Delachor, who's coming to the Mumbai Hematology Group in a couple of weeks time or in 10 days time to give, a, uh, give his thoughts on it. But this was a big effort from the EBMT aplastic anemia group uh, for which uh, Regis was the chair for. And this uh, uh, was a phase three trial of adding immunosuppression to L-thrombopag uh, in patients with severe or very severe aplastic anemia. And we showed that we were able to improve the CR rate at three months to 22% and the overall response rate with L-thrombopag to close to 7, 70% as well. So, and even if you look at it, there is a tripling of the CR rate at three months. So it's important to note that these drugs can give a early response in this uh, scenario because we know patients with aplastic anemia, predominantly the very severe ones, do, cannot get out of the hospital. They get so much complications, infections and bleeding complications as well. So it's important to achieve a early complete response in this group of patients as well. But unfortunately, in the NIH study, when they tried to uh, discontinue the cyclosporin, there was an increased risk of relapse. So the day discontinued at six months, they found the relapse was high. So they continued it for 24 months and found the relapse rate to be reduced as well. And the relapse seems to be happening when the cyclosporin was lowered or discontinued and the L-thrombopag was discontinued at six months. And we know nowadays we tend to... Um, tend to keep the L-thrombopag going for a bit longer than six months if patients do, do not achieve a, 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 achieve a good response, a good partial response or a complete response. So the good thing is that relapse can be, uh, if they relapse while you withdraw cyclosporin or L-thrombopag, you can rescue this group of patients, most patients, but not all of these patients as well. So essentially we are dealing with this context of now, l is springboarding these patients to get an early response and then maintain them on cyclosporin, but you still need to be careful about relapse in this context as well and whether reintroduction of l plus or minus increasing the dose of cyclosporin would prevent this as well. And thankfully, the clonal evolution rate seems to be lower in this group of patients when you use l here. Here you can see these patients' uh, clonal evolution rate at the, at the context of uh, uh, two years was 8%. And when you do it at, the con uh, at four years, it was 15%. But the higher risk clonal evolution, i.e. chromosome 7, complex and MDS AML, was seen only in 6% of this group of patients. Additionally, in the context of l thrombopag era, what we are seeing is that we are seeing uh, uh, early evolution rather than late. Because historically with IST, we used to see evolution happening uh, three years, five years, 10 years down the line. But in, in the context of l thrombopag seems to happen at an earlier time point. So you can pick these patients and age was the only factor which was predictive for high-risk evolution, i.e. older the individual is, the more risk of evolution. But what predicted for the transformation is always a difficult thing to uh, understand. Age was there and also the type of aplastic anemia, uh, but there was no impact on other factors and the mutations at baseline did not influence the evolution, although there were certain mutations at six months or at evolution, like the RUNX1, the ZBP, and the splicing factor mutations, which predicted for transformation to high-risk uh, aplastic anemia. But what about refractory, uh, refractory aplastic anemia? Um, uh, because this is a this is something we we worry about because refractory in the defined, uh, this is nearly 10 years back when uh, the, the definition of persistence of cytopenia was, uh, was uh, looked at, i.e. that when a patient has got severe persistent cytopenia after one course of ATG, uh, maybe six months, and the options were discussed at that time. So we always want to reevaluate because we don't want the patients to get uh, MDS. We want to continue the supportive care and we consider other options. 
Second courses of ATG and cyclosporin, be it switching from horse to rabbit or rabbit to horse, has been associated with the response rate in the context of 20 to 30 percent in refractory, not in relapsed aplastic anemia, and that can be that can be used as well. Androgens. So this is a study which was published in Hematologica from the EBMT group by Simona Paluca, showing that yes, androgens do have a role as well. And I sort of like uh, this as well because I tend to use danazole a lot in older patients who are refractory, relapsed, who do not have other therapeutic options, who are not eligible for stem cell transplantation. And it variably induces uh, response in about uh, 20 to 30 percent of patients as well. So you can rescue a third of these patients using, using this regimen. So there are a number of unmet needs in the uh, context of uh, if severe aplastic anemia, even in the l thrombopag era, because the durability, the lack of robustness, and the dependence, cyclosporin and l thrombopag dependence is also taken into account. And Obviously, in countries where even in India, lack of availability and the cost implications of horse ATG needs to be taken into account. And we know that the, we are not able to pick up the predictors of response or clonal evolution. And also in the refractory and ineligible for transplantation, these patients' options are quite limited as well. And older patients, we know cyclosporin is a horrible toxic drug predominantly for elderly patients and also, also women uh, because they do not like the complications, but also renal dysfunction, gum hypertrophy, so you need to be careful about it. So what are the newer treatments which are in the horizon, which are in clinical trials, and which I'll talk to you in the next five minutes? One of the drugs which surprisingly I thought has been shown in in vitro models by the NIH group is uh, is a drug called Rexolpinib. And you very well know that this is a um, this is the JAK inhibitor used in myelofibrosis, but it seems to be in the murine model uh, quite paradoxically that you are able to rescue the blood counts by T cell inhibition and reducing the marrow apoptosis and increasing the T regulatory cells as well. So this is as an ongoing trial in NIH, which is published now in blood as well. But these patients are uh, getting roxolitinib in a phase one, two study in refractory immune bone marrow failures at a dose which I thought was quite high because uh, you are treating this in patients who are pancytopenic, but uh, the, the scientific rationale seems to be so sound because these patients get 20 milligram twice a day, uh, baseline three months, and then uh, continue or not. And they are going to use it in severe aplastic anemia moderate aplastic anemia, and also single lineage cytopenias and also hyperplastic MDS. So let's wait and see. I'm no way encouraging anybody to use it until we have some preliminary data from the study because we know this can be, uh, this can make your blood counts worse and then can land in toxicity as well. The other drug which we've been doing clinical trials for the last year or so is a human, a human monoclonal antibody uh, called Regeneron 7257 that is bind directly to interleukin-2 receptor subunit gamma, uh, IL-2 receptor gamma. And this is present in a number of, uh, number of cytokine receptors like IL-2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 21. And essentially to suppress the cytokine the production of these cytokines by inhibiting their uh, common receptor chain. And uh, this is ongoing in a phase one, a part one, part B expansion trial. We finished the part A, and this is going to the part B as well. So we'll see, watch the space to see if these cases have got any, any good response. Is l thrombopack the only typomimetic? We know that romiplostin can be used as well. Data predominantly coming from the South Korean and the Japanese groups uh, indicating that romiplostin at a higher doses, as you can see, 10 microgram per kilogram or even 20 microgram per kilogram has induced uh, not only platelet responses, but trilineage responses. Avo thrombopag has been in clinical trials as well, and this has also has got uh, some role in it, but obviously, as you know, it's a less toxic drug on the liver with lack of drug and food interactions as well. So it might be worthwhile as a, as a therapeutic option in this group of patients. There are other ongoing clinical trials, some of which is indicated, some of them I did talk about as well. There is another uh, uh, 
formula, which are called heterothrombopack, predominantly I've only seen data in China and other places, but again, worth looking at. This is an NIH study where they are using early cyclosporin and l thrombopag that when a patient is diagnosed with pancytopenia, they give them l thrombopag and cyclosporin at a lower dose and then, and then take them to horse ATG. Uh, and some data has been shown, but not all of it, but we will watch the space for it. We've been trying to use T regulatory cells in aplastic anemia. So why T regulatory cells? Because they are important cells in the context of immune tolerance and suppression. So we are using expanded autologous T regulatory cells to treat uh, a, uh, to treat aplastic anemia, and uh, we have uh, we've got a phase one trial of this ongoing. Uh, assess about nine patients, predominantly to look at safety, but also to look at efficacy as well. So this trial is called Tierra. We are ongoing in this uh, in this trial as well. A word about non-severe aplastic anemia. So we put together a group of 259 patients with non-severe aplastic anemia. It was a multi-center effort between us, Cleveland Clinic, and a few centers in Italy. And it seems to be that in the context of non-severe aplastic anemia, there was very good response to combination of cyclosporin with L-thrombopag or cyclosporin or ATG cyclosporin or in a smaller number of patients just with L-thrombopag alone. So in patients with non-severe aplastic anemia who need treatment, the, you can use these agents with a very good effect. And it seems to be that the overall survival depends upon the presence of PNH clone, achievement of trilineage response, even if it's partial, indicating that these patients have a, a response to this treatment. So where have we moved in aplastic anemia? So you can look at this graph of survival based upon neutrophil count. So it was a, such a dismal survival in the context of aplastic anemia, more so for patients whose neutrophil count was less than 100. I think I'm hoping we have improved this overall survival over a period of time, both in uh, this is showing a race trial, uh, race trial data with improvement of the, of the marrow cellularity. But there should be caution required because we know Despite improvement in survival, there are issues we need to deal with, which I've alluded to in the presentation, like refractory aplastic anemia, l thrombopag cyclosporin dependence, elderly aplastic anemia, and clonal evolution. So this is my last slide, and with that, I'll finish you finish finish uh, today because this is giving you a conceptual approach to treatment of aplastic anemia, which is what. I have spoken to you over the last 40 minutes or so, i.e. the goal of treatment in aplastic anemia is to get the patients out of the hospital, get a rapid response, prevent infection, and to maintain the robustness of response and also not let them progress towards uh, MDS AML or get severe complications of GVHD and infections and second cancers with uh, stem cell transplantation. We do not talk much about fertility, quality of life, psychological support, but those are extremely, extremely important as well. And uh, novel therapy seems to be developing and we will see how things go over the next few years to see whether we'll get something better than ATG, something cheaper than ATG, something which can be easily deliverable to patients while we look at the haploidentical approach in transplantation, which is extremely important, especially for countries where access to treatment like ATG could be limited, while haploidentical donors are available for quite a lot of patients as well. So with that, I will stop and thank you, uh, Amit, once again for this kind invitation and obviously delighted and happy to discuss and take questions over the next, uh, next uh, minutes as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Austin. What a wonderful talk. It was fantastic and fabulous. And I now request all our discussions to please put the raise in sign so that we can start our question and session with Dr. Austin. Yes, Dr. Satish Kumar, your question please. 
Uh, thanks, Amit. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Really enjoyed your talk. I had attended it last time. Again, I have attended it and gained a lot of knowledge and a uh, lot of uh, new things I've learned from your talk. So I have some basic questions. What is the upper limit of age you have used ATG or when will you not use ATG? Any upper limit in the age? Yeah, so that's an important question, Satish, and thanks for bringing it up. And that's why I like this discussion more than my talk, I think, so because you can talk and listen. Uh, so I think there is no upper limit for age per se, but you're right in saying that we take uh, we take uh, the people over the age of 60 and 70 with very, very much precaution. So the, oh, the oldest patient I've treated is 80. And if you look in, at the race trial, the oldest patient was 81. And if you look at the NA, Age trial, the oldest patient was 82 as well. So there is no particular age limit, but if you have a patient who has no comorbidities, has got a good uh, ejection fraction with a good uh, performance status, then you can potentially do it. So, but I'll worry about patients between over oh, the age of 70. Um, the 70 to 80 is not common to treat, but uh, obviously you need to take 10 years slightly lower in a country like India, but obviously cardiovascular. Because the main thing I worry about ATG is the fluid accumulation, the tachybrady arrhythmias, and other complications in elderly elderly patients and renal dysfunction with cyclosporine as well. So the upshot is there is no particular cutoff, but above 70, you need to be extremely careful with this group of patients and make sure that their organ functions are pretty good, especially echo before you start the treatment. So you usually use the same dose, uh, Dr. Austin, the same dose, yeah. 70 to 80 yeah. also? Yeah, so we use the same uh, dose for four days. Right. I know there has been low dose regimens and slightly reduced predominantly in rabbit ATG, but also in horse ATG. Uh, I think you bring up another important point, but because who knows what's in ATG? Nobody knows. I tell patients it's a horse soup because nobody knows exactly what's in there. It's a concoction of multi-specific polyclonal antibodies. And to answer your question in a different way, I've got a patient who had one day of ATG treatment and had to stop because of bradyarrhythmias and liver dysfunction. And he has had a fantastic response. So who knows yes. what the right dose is? Yes. No, I have had a couple of patients like that where we have gone for a couple of days and they have responded. So my second question was, if they relapse, I mean, again, I'm speaking about more than 60 years, uh, with reasonably good performance status, if they relapse after six months uh, of ATG, uh, late relapse, I agree we can try the same horse ATG, but if they relapse uh, six months or so, would you give the same dose of horse ATG or will you switch over to rabbit ATG? I think you're exactly right. Early relapses, I've been, we've been treating them with uh, rabbit ATG rather than horse ATG. But it's interesting you say this is because with the expanding age of upper limit of transplantation and the use of cyclosporine and L-thrombopag as a combination, even in the, those relapse setting or other alternate agents, uh, I've only given a second dose of ATG uh, in the last 10 years for two patients. Yeah. And this is about 180 odd patients over the last 10 years. So the uh, possibility of using second ATG is going significantly down unless you have a re relapsed disease after what, two years, five years, then pay. definitely these patients should be tried. But to answer your question directly, yes, I would switch for early relapses into, uh, into rabbit ATG. And same for refractory as well. I wouldn't repeat horse ATG. I would give rabbit ATG. And one last question. How do you monitor for clonal evaluation of the immunosuppressive therapy? So we, uh, I think I take it in a slightly different aspect uh, uh, in two ways, because one, if a patient has a very good counts, yeah, CR or a good PR and a good quality of life, I just monitor them with blood counts. I do not go subject them to doing mutations or bone marrows and other things. It's only in patients who have a poor response or relapse or drop in their blood counts, we do a bone marrow and also try to do myeloid gene panel and cytogenetics to monitor this group of uh, group of patients. Because the problem is doing genetic panels for everybody. What if you find a runs one mutation in somebody who's got a CR with a good quality of life and a platelet count of more than 100? What are you, <laughs> it's, it's something you feel like, should I have not done it at all, is it? Sometimes yeah. uh, less knowledge is better in this situation, so I think so.
increases anxiety for both the patient and the doctor. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Austin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Satish. In the same context, do we need to reduce the dose of cyclosporine if you are treating elderly population? Yeah, so I tend to go at a 50% dose to begin with in an elderly. So normally we use a total dose of what, 5 milligram per kilogram to keep a levels between 100 to 200. For elderly, I tend to start at 2.5 milligram and then slowly build it up. If they tolerate, if the levels are low, uh, renal functions are okay, they're not screaming at you by giving a toxic drug to them, then you slowly build the build the dose over a period of time rather than rather than going straight at a higher dose and then they just totally don't like the drug at all and then you can't reintroduce. So slow slow pick pickup is what I tend to do. Again, this is not written anywhere, it's just a practical thing we do. Thank you, sir. Dr. Amrita Saraf, ma'am. You're muted. Mute. Sorry. So it was a beautiful lecture. Hello, everyone. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed the new uh, treatment strategies and the work you are doing. So I have a question related to the diagnostic workup. Like when we talk about uh, hypocellular marrow and we have a differential, so it could be hyperplastic MDS or aplastic anemia. And sometimes we don't know like what's going to be the PNH percentage. So uh, I think uh, what basic diagnostic workup you will advise in a suspected case when we get a sample with pancytopenia and a hypocellular marrow. First question is this. And second, like how frequently one should consider uh, monitoring of these percentage of PNH population in such cases uh, whether you put the patient on therapy or uh, after starting the therapy. I hope I am able to ask the question correctly. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's fine. I'll take the second question first because uh, monitoring of the PNH clone, the clone is dependent uh, in various centers. We tend to, for patients with aplastic anemia, even if they have a small subclinical PNH clone, we tend to monitor it first year at least every three monthly intervals and then and if the clone is very small and it's not progressing and it's not associated with hemolytic markers we tend to do it every six months after that as well but at least yearly ones with hemolytic markers as well um, and that is irrespective of what treatment they've had or not had for their aplastic uh, aplastic anemia so that's one thing the first question is about diagnostic workup and i would suggest if it's possible both economic and at the center, I would suggest we should do whatever we can do for these patients with hyperplastic marrow. Because I keep saying aplastic anemia is definitely a diagnosis of exclusion. You don't look at it and say, and we, some patients get two or three bone marrows before we get to it, because there is something which is definitely not well described in the literature, which is called evolving aplastic anemia. You see patient at an early time point, they have a reasonably good counts, and then three months down the line, the counts start to go down. So when you do the bone marrow at an early phase, they will be a bit cellular. They might have a B12 deficiency, folate deficiency as well, and then you correct them, nothing happens as well. So uh, the value of bone marrow and repeating it is quite important in this group of patients. When I talk about accessory investigations, I would definitely do a PNH clone because that helps you some most of the time. Say if a patient has got 80% or 50% PNH clone, you don't need to worry about the inherited screen at all because they're less likely to have an inherited bone marrow failure. It's more likely to be an acquired bone marrow failure. And uh, at least we should do a cytogenetics and a fish panel for trisomy 8, 13, monosomy 7, and other abnormalities so that you don't miss any of those abnormalities and also high-risk uh, MDS fish features as well. Uh, the germline, because as I was telling in the lecture, I'm very impressed with the turnaround time for these germline ones. I see a number of reports coming from India, from number of laboratories, but med genomics and other things. And it's it's pretty, pretty good is what I would say. And it helps as well to delineate this group, predominantly for pediatricians. If there are any pediatricians among you, it helps because the every patient with pediatric presentation, you always suspect is this germline or is this not really, is it? So those are the tests I would suggest that you should do. And obviously hematopathologists are very good service in India as well. 
needing to rule out fibrosis, infiltrative conditions and all those things. And I don't know, I have had chats with a number of people in India as well, because there are some regions where there is toxic exposure to fertilizers, chemicals and other agents as well, because we don't want to be put off by those as well. And that's very important to rule out as well. Thank you. There is one more question I have. It's basically more of a comment that we had a study where we looked for a PNH clone by high sensitivity flow cytometry, and it included cases of aplastic as well as MDS. And we found significant number, even though it was uh, not a very big number of patients, just roughly 60 patients we studied. So they were around 86% uh, we found in aplastic anemia and around 33% in MDS. And then later we also detected that, you know, LDH was a very important marker, which was, which showed its uh, significance in cases with aplastic as well as with MDS. So uh, what I was wondering, like in case it can be there, I mean, a cutoff can be generated, like our study was quite small, but have you noticed that if LDH can be used as a, a pointer or as a predictive marker, in cases where we can go for a high sensitivity flow cytometry, since practically it's not possible to do it in all the suspected patient, but being an important marker, and as a result of this small study, which was published also in an Indian journal, I would like to know your uh, opinion in this. Yeah, no, I think I think you're 100% right. LDH is a very, very good marker, very sensitive, very cheap, available everywhere. Yeah. So if you have a high LDH, you should definitely go for testing for the PNH. And also important in patients with non-severe AA, because they might have a bit of reticulocytosis as well, or normal reticulocyte count with a high LDH, low haptoglobulin. Haptoglobulin is also a very good marker in that scenario as well. So those are important things. So we've done a large study, which was published in leukemia, and I showed one slide on it. So we looked at 3,059 patients with uh, pancytopenia. Uh, that included MDS, aplastic anemia, and other myeloid conditions as well. And in MDS, we found it in about 18% of patients. And aplastic anemia, we found it in about 40 to 50% of patients. So it is present, but the question is, how much is it helping on a therapeutic decision for treating or diagnosing and differentiating between aplastic anemia and hyperplastic MDS is important. But the one question is definitely, everybody uses it to make sure it's not an acquired aplastic, uh, it's not an inherited one. So that's something we need to take home. Fine, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Nidhi Jain, your question, please. Thank you, Amit. Uh, thank you, Dr. Austin, for a wonderful talk. So I have a very simple question regarding patients who are intolerant to cyclosporine or patients who have an upfront renal dysfunction and you decide to treat with immunosuppressive therapy. Do you replace cyclosporine with MMF or serolimus or, and what is the dose which you prefer? Like uh, if the patient is so intolerant to cyclosporine and not ready to take even a reduced dose or develops a renal dysfunction, then how do you go about it? Yeah, again, that's a difficult scenario. So alternatives we have used uh, is uh, we use tacrolimus, but you might say it will have the same issue as uh, a cyclosporin, which is true as well. But we found one or two patients tolerate tacrolimus better than cyclosporin, but not from a renal dysfunction perspective, but predominantly from a tolerability perspective. So we predominantly used cyrolimus, yeah. And cyrolimus, we use varying doses, but we tend to get to a level of between four to eight if it's possible, yeah. MMF, we do not use. There is no studies of using MMF as an, as an immunosuppressive therapy in the context of aplastic anemia. I know in a post-transplant setting, we always replace cyclosporin with a bit of MMF, low dose of cyclosporin, even in aplastic anemia. But in the context of uh, non-transplant patients with aplastic anemia, MMF doesn't have a significant role at all. So predominantly tacrolimus, but more and more cyrolimus, we are using it in, in this scenario as well. Uh, thank you. And then the next question in the same uh, this thing is that, that cyclosporine in your practice, like we've seen in the studies that as soon as you start tapering cyclosporine early on, like six months, post to the therapy, they tend to, you know, develop cytopenias again. So is it that you tend to practice that after six months, we can reduce the dose and maintain it something like two mg per kg and continue it for say around two, three years and, or how do you go about yeah. it? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I, 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 we are very different in UK. We do not taper at six months at all. I know that's what the NIH does and other things. We do not taper at two or six months. So the way we taper is we taper if a patient has achieved a CR, yeah? And once they've achieved a CR, we leave them on CR for six months, yeah? Or they've achieved a plateau, i.e. they are not likely to get any further better than what, what they've had yeah, like a plateau type of response. And then slowly taper down by 25 milligram every eight weeks or something like that. Yeah, and then slowly get them off it. So some patients have taken three years, four years before they are totally off the treatment at all. So so we do it very, very slowly because, because you know that, is it? Like the last thing you want is these patients losing response. You've you said you we've done so much to get them to a response and we don't want to lose it. So I'd be very, very conservative on slowly reducing the cyclosporin so that you don't you've not lost the benefit of what you achieved. Okay. Uh, thank you. And if I, I may ask one more question re regarding the transplant conditioning. So you said that uh, I think more or less you're using the CAMPAT based conditioning, uh, FluSci and CAMPAT. So is there any reason why a CAMPAT over ATG, is there any difference when we use ATG versus CAMPAT? So your experience as well as inputs in that here. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's a, we don't use ATG at all in this scenario because we've been using the campus based regimen for uh, aplastic anemia. It's uniform across a, a UK, and now we've got around 850 patients who've had campus based conditioning for aplastic anemia. We are putting together that data. Extremely low risk of GVHT. The risk of acute uh, GVHT is about 4%. Yeah. And the risk of chronic grade three, grade four GVHT is about 7%. And graph failure rates are not low or low as well. Because the advantage of campus is you don't need to do bone marrow stem cells. You just use peripheral blood stem cells. And because you use peripheral stem cells, you get a good dose because graph failure is a big issue. If you get smaller dose, both in the bone marrow, we don't use methotrexate. So the GVHT rate is the main reason for uh, going to campus and extremely low. And now with the more widespread use, I don't know whether you use letermovir as prophylaxis in India, not yet. Um, we used to see quite a lot of CMV reactivations following campus in the context of transplant, but now with the letter mover, we are preventing that CMV reactivations uh, quite easily, at least in the first 100, 200 days, and then they've got a good counts, and then we're able to contact. So we have used campus, and we're very pleased with the outcomes with the campus based regimen. So actually, if I talk about the Indian scenario, the chances of infections are post-transplant also pretty high here. So if, uh, you know, in between there was an availability of CAMPAT, mm -hmm. uh, routinely we do ATG, we do not do CAMPAT at all. But if I have to ask you regarding the Indian scenario, preference of CAMPAT versus ATG, if it is available over here. So would you recommend that for our scenario or would that increase I, the chances of infection? No, I still would recommend. The reason being these infections are viral reactivations, not uh, bacterial, multi-resistant bacterial and other things. If that's the case, then it's it's uh, it's not going to be different in different obviously cmv adeno ebv ebv ptlds and other things are there but it's mostly viral reactivations rather than bacterial multi resistance so i would i would prefer and obviously it's a it's a different thing with campus compared to uh, atg but atg is what is used outside uk in europe as well with very good uh, responses like either sci atg or Flu psi ATG with uh, with two grade with two grade with two grade TBI. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor Nidhi. Uh, Doctor Ranjit Matthew Vargis, your question, please. Yeah, uh, Doctor Austin, thank you for this lucid talk. My question is: Do you use any specific cutoff for uh, PNH clone to differentiate between an IDMFS versus a immune plastic? So is there any specific cutoff? Because uh, if we look at the data, then it says that generally in IBMFS, there is no immune-mediated attack. So there shouldn't be, theoretically, there shouldn't be any PNS clone, but that is not the case. So do you have any specific cutoffs? No, there is no cutoff. And you're right. There are, there are very rare cases of inherited bone marrow failures who do have a very, very small clone, but they never have a 
large clone at all. So I don't think so there is a specific cutoff and it's so difficult to define that cutoff even if you have data and other things like that. So I would I, I would not use a specific cutoff, but say for example, if you have a persistent PNH clone and uh, it, I'm not talking about 0.01%, we're talking about 1% and above. So okay. I think, yeah, I think if you are pushing me for a number, that's what I will get at, but without any data. But I would say it's low transient clones can be seen, but not like a proper persistent clone of 1% or more. So that's probably where I would use. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranjit. Dr. Radhika Shetty, your question, please. You're muted, Dr. Radhika. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashish. That was a complete presentation. Beautiful. Uh, my question is, uh, the rapid telomere senescence is like significantly seen in acquired plus anemia cases, which is, uh, it's like not a feasible option to test for it in our scenario. So how about adding on danazole upfront in aplastic anemia cases? Because I have been practicing that uh, in the past, like I've been adding danazole to almost all my cases of acquired aplastic anemia upfront to the ACE regimen. That means uh, I'm switching over from uh, a triad regimen to a quadruplet. So what's your opinion on that? Danazole being the fourth agent. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think there are a number of answers to that. Danazole has been used in upfront setting with ATG in the 1980s. There is a there is a good trial of it, and there was no uh, there was no benefit at that time in the randomized trial setting. And you're right; in countries like Japan and other places, they do use danazole as well. So it is the worry about using all four drugs is uh, I would worry about liver dysfunction, tolerability, and other things because. ATG is hepatotoxic, uh, l thrombopack is hepatotoxic, danazole is hepatotoxic. You don't want to make, and then steroids as well. You don't want patients to get significant complications. And then I know you use it and you have experience, which is fantastic. I, uh, I, but, but the problem is if somebody gets a toxicity, you wouldn't know which drug is doing what is it. That's where I'll be worried, worried about. But I use danazole a lot. Danazole is a good drug. I've used danazole in combination with cyclosporin, danazole in combination with L-thrombopack, but never as four regimen in the context of uh, ATG, cyclosporin, L-thrombopack, and danazole. We'll all become like myeloma doctors with triplets and quadruplets now, I think. So is it. No, it's a, it's a good drug, and but I would be very careful. Plus, you're also throwing everything at the patient, and if they do not respond, you're only left with transplant as an option as well, is it? So, uh, but you're right. Biologically, more than telomere senescence, it does have a role in implicating, in elongating the telomeres. And it's also possibly got some immunomodulatory role because it does respond in older people as well. Is that based on telomere attrition? Is that based on other immunological effects? We don't know, but it does have a response, yeah. I'll be interested to see your data, even if it's a small number of patients. It's it's quite interesting to see that. But tolerability, toxicity is what I would be worried about. I feel that the hype of hepatotoxicity by Danazole, uh, the way it is presented in the literature, is not actually practically seen. Because no, we use, no, yeah. not only my yeah. colleagues and all, we use Danazole very like rampantly, but we don't see that kind of hepatotoxic the way it is presented in the literature. Yeah, you, you yeah, not at a lower dose, like like 100, 200, 300, 400 doesn't give, but if you go higher up like 800, it can do. And it's also the cholesterol, the cholesterols go up and then you need to monitor for adenomas and other things. Yeah, you're right. It's not like as much as it's hyped because people use doses up to 800 milligram and that is definitely a bit toxic. I don't know. I'll be interested to hear how much dose do you use? I start with 200, t uh, 200 BD twice a day. And then if I don't see a significant response, I, I mean, I uh, increase it to 200 TID, 600 per day. 600, yeah. And that is a safe dose. In spite of adding all the three drugs, I really don't see a very great hepatotoxic in my, I mean, okay. in, in our... But I think of... if that's the case, the biggest question is, do you see a improvement in the response because you've added danazole or is this just we are making ourselves happy by giving four drugs i personally feel that there is a significant improvement it's not marginal it is a significant improvement yeah. it's but just my, sector, my set of colleagues also do practice this and we all personally believe that uh, it does add on to the benefit 
though we have not like published any data on this. Yeah, I think uh, obviously in a meeting like this, I can't obviously without data, I can't, I can't. There is no published data at all anywhere in the literature of using those four drugs. So I think, but I think uh, again, personal experience and practices were more important than data. So you need to be careful, but you need to collect the data and put it out. Even if it's a small number of 10 or 20 patients, it's important to show that. I have one more question to ask you, sir. I mean, this is transplant related because you touched upon the transplant also here. So I have a 51 years man, a case of aplastic anemia diagnosed 15 years back at the age of 35 years. He was transplanted upon with a matched sibling donor, his sibling, his sister being the donor. That was 15 years back. Uh, Post-transplant, some liver GVHD managed. He has a pulmonary tuberculosis managed. Chronic ocular GVHD. Right now, some topical immunosuppressant, but not in any systemic therapy. Down the line, 15 years later, the plastic anemia relapsed post-transplant. But he retained 100% donor chimerism. So what is uh, what should be the plan? What should be the next uh, line of action? Is it CD34 boost enough or ATG plus CD34 boost or should we go ahead with a retransplant? Now the man is 51 years, chronic ocular GVHD, three topical immunosuppressive agents, no systemic. The man looks a little, I mean, he's, Physically shrunk in. He's not like the fit, healthy young man. His sibling is now 61 years. Yeah. So so this is a phenomenon which has been described. So this is called donor-related aplasia or donor transplant, a DTA or donor-related aplasia, which has been described. And we've got a few cases as well. They are very difficult to manage, but more so, I wouldn't, if they had GVHD and if he's not as fit as he was before, I would only think of immunosuppression to see whether we can modulate either with ATG or cyclosporin and see if we can improve <coughs> improve his counts. Presumably, he's symptomatic of his counts. Is it low counts? Very low counts, sir. He is transmission dependent. Plated count is uh, fluctuating between 5,000 to 10,000. He's on IST, triple IST for the last three months. We have explored that option, Eltromobat, cyclosporin, Danazol, but uh, it has not cost any. Rather, the counts are further like... Mm. Uh, Ideally, we tend to we tend to say with this donor derived one to think of a second transplant if they're fit and eligible and using an alternate donor, but it looks like it might not be possible in your in your case, is it? Yeah. Cd thirty four boost isolated Cd thirty four boost does it have any role or it's... from which from which donor? Donor, I have only one donor, one sibling with sixty one years. Yeah, but but if you're saying that it this likely could be a donor derived aplasia, your immune system is fully from the donor, and you're giving CD thirty four, it will all be mopped out. I think so. I don't know. It's a difficult one, but unlikely the boost will help. Yeah. We're planning as of now tentatively we are planning for is retransplant in this case. We're already like uh, and uh, I mean now. Uh, gave uh, G and then uh, FRS the donor. We got around CD34 count of 5 from the donor. We just cry over results. We are planning like what should be the conditioning in this case. Should I give the high dose of cyclophosphamide or reduce the cyclophos cyclophosphamide dose for this patient because it's a little shrunken and delicate now. Yeah. We are not yeah, it's difficult. I don't, I don't think so. Isolated CD34 top up would help because this is immunologically mediated from the donor. I do not think so. You probably need to use a bit of flu or a bit of ATG to aid and aid the aid that aid the immunomodulation to help engraftment. I, I think so, but obviously difficult. <laughs> Fingers crossed. We are taking up this case for a retransplant here. Thank you, Dr. Radhika. Uh, sir, there are some couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Arisha Jain was what is the pathophysiological basis of defining cutoffs for major and minor PNH clones? Oh, no, there's no pathophysiological basis, but the, but the one which was used many, many years back is subclinical, um, and uh, which is less than one person, one to ten percent is uh, um, is 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 sort of minor, and then you have the fifty percent, which is the major clone. But there is no pathophysiological. I think for for me, the PNH clone is a dynamic thing. So we just need to we need to monitor it over a period of time rather than to see if it's going up or down, variable type of thing, rather than having cutoffs as such. Thank you, sir. Another question from Dr. Aryad Jain. At what age cutoff in a healthy transplant eligible patient of aplastic anemia with a full sibling match would you prefer ATG cyclosporin health over transplant? 
I think we've gone up as uh, as um, as I said in the talk, uh, Arihant, that we go up to age up to 50 years as well. Yeah, if they have a good sibling donor, if they do not have significant comorbidities, they're fit, we've gone up. And that age is expanding as well. So we are in the process of thinking of doing an upfront study of uh, ATG cyclosporin L thrombophag versus transplantation in those group of patients as well above the age of 40 uh, if they have a sibling donor or even unrelated donors if they are if they are the over the age of 20 as well so but that will take 10 years to complete this kind of study to get an outcome from it so uh, so for up to 50 we do uh, definitely consider upfront sibling donor transplant preferably over an ATG cyclosporin, more so in patients with very severe or severe if they're symptomatic and they're landing in trouble. Thank you, sir. Another question from Dr. Krishna Nathanam Kanan. How do you manage toxic toxin-induced severe aplastic anemia like benzene? Will immunosuppressive therapy be useful in such cases? Uh, I think it's difficult, is it? Because benzene has been very much associated more with MDS as well, and that that's it's a it's a difficult one. I do I think your stem cells have totally gone. I don't think so. Immunosuppressive therapy will work, but I personally do not have any experience, zero experience in this. Uh, if there is no stem cells, I think transplantation is probably the only way of rescuing this group of patients because I don't think so there is anything immunologically mediated. The stem cells have gone. That's about it, I think. So if it is to benzene-induced total marrow failure rather than MDS, even with MDS, they don't recover yet. True, sir. Another question from Dr. Arya Jain. What are the response rates of adding ATG to cyclosporin backbone in patients who have been non-responded to cyclosporin for quite a few months? Yeah, so that data is not available yet. Um, we have some preliminary data, uh, uh, but uh, the it seems to be that, so there are two or three ways this data will come up out, yeah? So we are putting together a group of patients where we were not able to give ATG during the COVID pandemic. So we just gave single agent cyclosporin or cyclosporin with l pack and then they came in for ATG. Um, their response rates are not as great as before because you're technically saying you've tried some immunomodulation and they've not worked. But this data from NIH, which where they're using cyclosporin l thrombopag, you know, the very early treatment, that might uh, um, help to uh, understand what proportion of patients. Just for example, Ariant, you know what they're doing in NIH is even if a patient responds to cyclosporin and l thrombopag, they still give ATG. So we might never know what the long-term outcome of those group of patients if we didn't give ATG. I would have designed a study if they responded to cyclosporin l thrombopag, I'll leave them alone and not give ATG. But I think they are doing a study where everybody gets ATG. It's just that they're preventing the early complication. Thank you, sir. Another question from Dr. Krishna Rathalam Kanan. Is telomere length routinely done for acquired aplastic anemia? And if so, how do you interpret the results for the same? Yeah, so we do it, uh, but we do it by a qPCR methodology. We don't do flow fish methodology, uh, but interpretation is based, uh, it's already given that. So if it's more than the 10th centile, then that's definitely acquired aplastic anemia. If it's less than the first centile, it's more likely inherited bone marrow failure. But if it's between the first and the 10th centile, then that's a bit tricky. Then you need to evaluate these patients to make sure that they don't have uh, any, 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 any inherited uh, genetic defect. Thank you, sir. Another question from Dr. Aryan Jain. Does continuing TPO-RA agonist beyond six months in those patients who attain partial response with ATG cyclosporin l helps in decreasing the response uh, relapse or improving the response rates? Again, no data yet available, but practically, I know there was another question from the chat for people who do not respond at six months or partial response. I would keep them going for another three months at least, nine months, because you don't want to give it too long as well. More so if a patient is transplant eligible and they've got donors and other things, I'd be careful from not prolonging the TPO, uh, TPO RA use in patients who are uh, who are still having a bit of a partial response. But we do continue sometimes up to nine months, occasionally a year, but I've never done it beyond a year. 
Thank you, sir. Another question from Dr. Aryan Jain. In patients who are heavily pre-transfused by the time they are taken for transplant, do you suggest adding a low dose of TBI in a meth sibling donor setting as well as uh, to the flu side ATG backbone? Um, I, I think, again, there is no data on that uh, because... Uh, your 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 rationale is right because you, what you are saying is multiply transfused allo antibodies is there a risk of graft rejection or engraftment failure uh, but you have to weigh up with the ba balance I know two grade TBI is not much of a toxic regimen at all it's a very small dose uh, but I, I again it's difficult to know without data. What to, show, what to show, because the flu data seems to help in that scenario as well. Plus we, as I said before, we tend to use a lot of peripheral blood stem cells in this scenario and campus based, and we don't see that much of a engraftment failure, graft failure. We only tend to do the TBI if they fail the first graft and we have to give second, then we use flu ATG with a bit of TBI and then give uh, stem, uh, stem cell top up, not stem cell top up, just uh, um, just stem cells. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Another question from Dr. Krishnanathan Kanan. Do you give pneumocystis carinine prophylaxis post ATG? If so, uh, no. how, how do you give co-trimoxisome with thrombocytopenia? Yeah, no, in UK, we do not give it because we've not seen any PCP, PJP in our population with aplastic anemia in that setting. In in US, they use it routinely, in, even in NIH. They do not use septrin. They use inhaled pentamidin for the first six months. Yeah, so you can take whichever way. You can take a UK approach, not give anything, or a US approach and give pentamidin nebulizers if it's available. Thank you, sir. And the similar question from Dr. Aryan Jain, duration of cyclosporine in patients who attain a partial response versus those who are attaining uh, complete response at six months with ATG cyclosporine ethanol pack who do not have any other transplant options or salvage options. Yeah, so as I was explaining to, I think it was Nidhi, Nidhi Jain earlier on, is it like the, I do not taper. So as I said, if they achieve a complete response, I still do not taper until they've had a six months of complete response at a plateau. If they achieve a partial response, I would see whether they achieve a plateau type of response, i.e. you've given it partial response for about six months, they're not getting better, they're not getting worse, then they will. I will slowly, slowly reduce reduce the dose of cyclosporin after leaving them on a plateau phase for a good six months and then reduce by 25 milligram every eight weekly or sometimes I do 25 milligram every three monthly as well to very, very slowly come off, come off it. I think hope I answered that question. Is it? Is there anything bits to that? No. Absolutely. Another question from Dr. Ayushi, if the patient is not given ATG cyclosporin althomopec but kept on only cyclosporin plus althomopec in a case of severe aplastic anemia, how do you taper althomopec and how do you taper cyclosporin in such cases? Yeah, so that's also an important question. So this data should be published soon. It's the SOAR trial, which was done in Spain, yeah, Brazil, Spain, and a few other countries as well. Uh, a few patients with, uh, with the cyclosporin L thrombopac was the combination in patients with very, very severe and severe aplastic anemia. The response rate was around 40 to 50 percent from memory. Uh, and there, there is some data to suggest how you taper. So even in that trial, it was six months of L thrombopac and it was stopped. Yeah. Uh, but I think more data might evolve from that, which will tell us how to taper it. I still, even at six months, I don't abruptly stop the L-thrombopag at all. I tend to halve the dose or reduce to 150 to 100 and then 100 to 50 and then slowly taper off because I, I just don't uh, like the abrupt halt of medications when the patients are in a precarious state still. Thank you, sir. Another very similar question from Dr. Sutan Thira Kanan Ramamurthy. If the patient develops only a partial response to cyclosporin l do you wish to continue indefinitely for such patients? Not really, because I would not continue l thrombopag indefinitely at all. The first drug a child taper and stop is l thrombopag and then cyclosporin. So, uh, sorry, I'm not answering your question directly, but I'm saying a sequence-wise, I would reduce the l thrombopag first, come, come off it, and then reduce the cyclosporin. Because partial response is still sometimes good. Because remember, even 
in the non l thrombophag era the complete response was about 17% in the l thrombophag era the complete response is 30% yeah so it's not most of the responses are partial responses so we just we just need to be careful about it more so in a patient who does not have any other options available i.e. like a transplant thank you sir very similar question other i think you answered that question other than ngs what other methods are available at your center to diagnose a telomere disorder? Is doing a flow fish very sensitive as compared to other techniques? Yeah, I think flow fish is the gold standard, but we are quite com comfortable with our qPCR, which is an easy technique to do. Flow fish needs a quite a lot of uh, a uh, lot of expertise and other things. As far as I know, it's only available in two centers, one in Vancouver, another one is in, uh, in uh, not SN, in Tim Brumendorf Center in Germany. Even they send it to Vancouver for validation and verification. So we got a project ongoing where we are comparing qPCR with flow fish with another technique called Stella, which is single telomere and uh, elongation length technique, which looks at the 17p telomere length. But the preliminary data seems to be pretty good that the qPCR is very good. It's a screening test. It's not a diagnostic test. So telomere length is a screening test. And then we would probably go in to look for, um, look for uh, uh, the inherited panel. So we do a panel of around 100 or 150 genes. And what I haven't mentioned to you is we always do a depth test at the outset for patients with aplastic anemia to rule out Fanconi or... Uh, you call it what uh, the mitomycin breakage or the deoxy di di deoxybutane or uh, stress stress cytogenetics, whichever way you call it. Thank you, sir. I'm going to repeat question from Aryat Jean. Uh, if the patient develops cyclosporin and nephrotoxicity, does MMF well as well in such cases? No, I think I was talking to somebody else earlier on. Is that I have not seen any data for MMF. So I would do TAC if they're tolerating, but if they're not TAC, cyrolimus is probably what I have used and personally have experience with, not MMF. Thank you, sir. Dr. Shyam has a case. How do you treat a case of 50 years old, severe aplastic anemia with monosomy 7? Do you recommend NGS? Uh, that is the first question, yeah. Okay, so that's an important question. If you go in NIH, if a patient has got severe aplastic anemia and have got monosomy 7, they will not go into any aplastic anemia trial protocol. They will be considered more as an MDS and they will get transplant. We have had patients with monosomy 7 with aplastic anemia who have responded to ATG. So in this case, you need to be extremely careful or you, def you need to rely on your histopathologist. Is it definitely aplastic anemia? other than monosomy seven, that's number one. And number two is, depending on the age, I know you said 51, but I would be careful about ruling out uh, familial monosomy seven syndromes like the SAMD9, SAMD9L, GATA2, all those things to make sure you're definitely dealing with an acquired aplastic anemia. NGS might help because here, if you do an NGS and find that it's quite bland, then you're left with possibly one of these rare cases where there is monosomy 7 in the context of aplastic anemia, and you would follow the algorithm of giving either ATG cyclosporin or, or, or transplant. I would Monosomy 7 is always a bad thing. I think so. So I might err uh, towards a transplant in this kind of cases, but these are difficult ones. Thank you, sir. Do you recommend NGS for old aplastic anemia? Uh, I'm sort of slightly conflicted, although I've done a lot of work on that. I'm slightly conflicted in the sense like, yes, it is helpful, uh, but it all depends on your center as well. I would say, so in the last 100 cases where we think this patient has got aplastic anemia and diagnosed them confidently, none of them had a mutation more than 5%. So it depends on your tech, on your con clinical confidence in making a diagnosis of aplastic anemia. But if you are not seeing aplastic anemia and you see one every five years or something like that, and your histopathologist is not sure, then NGS can help. Because if you think it's aplastic anemia and the NGS comes back with three mutations, it's not aplastic anemia, it's something else. So it all relies, relies on your diagnostic technique and histopathology and how supportive and other things are. So I would say, yes, Yes, it does have a role, but mainly to make sure 
you're totally not making a wrong decision from the diagnosis at the outset and you're not missing. And we've had patients where it was picked up as a rungs one at 50% and then we said, oh, this is constitutional rungs one and then gone into do a skin biopsy and other things as well. So it does help in different ways, but you need to make, do not essentially totally make a decision based on the NGS is what I would take say as a take home. Thank you, sir. So that's what the question he asked. You answered that. Does the molecular pattern on NGS make you decision making versus task plan versus ATG? I, I, I would say the decision making on the NGS will tell me, is it really a plastic anemia or is it MDS? And then the decision makes easier for therapeutics, is it? So if it's MDS, then you're more for transplant. If it's a plastic, you'll follow the treatment algorithm. Sir, your experience with Evatrombopec? Uh, zero. I've not used it. We can't use it in UK. So zero. So that's where guys in India, you you have more access to these drugs sometimes and you probably have more experience. Thank you, sir. And a pop-up question from Ariad Jean. Uh, three months and six months response rates and survival with ATG cyclosporin l thrombopectin subset who are very severe aplastic anemia at diagnosis. So very severe, I'd be careful about it because uh, if you're very severe and you've not had a response in three or four months, I would sort of move towards the transplant if they have donor within six months. Because every patient with very severe and severe, we tissue type them at the outset in our center. So we identify donors and be ready to act on. Although all the data will say wait for six months, I will wait, but make start making the decisions at three months. Because we all know, you say you do a transplant, you can't have it done tomorrow. You need to wait for a couple of months. So start making, thinking of the decisions at three to four months so that you, you can at least do the transplant at six months. Because if you think of, decisions at six months, you won't get to a transplant until nine months or a year. So uh, make sure that the make sure that we have that in the background if a patient is not showing signs of response, because at six months, if they show a fantastic response and they say, I don't want a transplant, that's perfectly fine. But uh, you need to be careful about uh, anticipating. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sumit Mirk has raised a question, why peripheral blood is equivalent to bone marrow? harvest when using Kempeth conditioning, while well, the same is not true for ATG. Yeah, yeah. We don't know why. We don't know what the rationale and the basis of it, but where one of the advantages of peripheral blood is you get good stem cell dose. Yeah. Okay. So put it this way. Aplastic anemia is the only condition where recommendation everywhere is to use a bone marrow derived stem cell source because you do not get the risk of GVHD. You reduce the risk of GVHD in the bone marrow stem cell source compared to a peripheral blood for obvious reasons. But in the context of G, uh, scamper, the GVHD rates are so low that the ability of camper to overcome that risk of GVHD is uh, is mitigated even when we use a peripheral blood stem cell harvest despite us not using methotrexate yeah so that is one of the reasons the second reason i think is a bit more practical i don't know about india but the countries everybody has now lost the trick of doing a proper bone marrow harvest because people can't do a proper bone marrow harvest because you get a low stem cell dose and then that makes it even worse. So you get to aplastic anemia where we need a higher stem cell dose. So you lose the ability to give a good stem cell dose. So those are the rationale behind it. But mechanistically, Campus seems to have a significantly reduced risk of GBHT because of how it works. And that is the reason we are even able to use peripheral blood in that context. Thank you, sir. Dr. S.K. Sharma wants to know your anti-infectious protocol at your center for aplastic anemia management. ATG, you mean, or transplant ATG? Who are on conservative management? Oh, yeah. So we tend to give mold-active antifungals, predominantly posoconazole, for patients with neutrophils less than 500 into 10 to the power, sorry, less than 0.5 into 10 to the power of 9 or 500. And also prophylactic antibiotics, which would be uh, levofloxacin or ciprofloxacin type of combination. We, if they get cyclosporin, we tend to give acyclovir as well. That's about it. And as I told you, we do not routinely use PJP, PCP prophylaxis. Thank you, sir. Dr. Uh, for the question from Dr. Avinash Singh, dose of danazole in a case of severe aplastic anemia? 
Yeah, so I think uh, Radhika was mentioning that before, is it? So I go up up to 600 milligram, although uh, sometimes people go up to 800. So you can use, I start off 100 and then go up, but you can go up from 200 and then build it up to 400 and 600 as well. Thank you, sir. Another question from Dr. Abhinav Singh. Severe aplastic anemia with chronic liver disease, your treatment options? Depends on how the chronic liver disease is because it's so uh, so difficult, is it? Because if they have significant chronic liver disease, unfortunately, you can't do it, do anything about it. But if it's if you are meaning post hepatitis A, you should follow the same route as an immune mediated aplastic anemia side uh, side of things. Uh, obviously, I'd be careful about using l thrombopag in this scenario. So cyclosporin, although cyclosporin can give hepatotoxicity. The other thing is you need to make sure that the liver disease is not due to a PNH clone and a butchiary and a chronic uh, uh, chronic thrombosis and hypersplenism and portal hypertension as well. So you just need to make sure or not due to iron overload because it's quite not uncommon to get iron overload and liver dysfunction in these in these group of patients as well. Sorry, I'm not answering your question, but it's very non-specific when you just say chronic liver disease. Sorry about that. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sumit Beck has a question. ATG should be preferred close to stem cell infusion or farther away from the conditioning? What's your take on this? So as I said, we do not use ATG conditioning, but ATG is is usually given on I think day minus three, day minus four, if I'm not wrong in the flu sci flu sci ATG, sorry, uh, flu sci ATG protocol. So I don't think so it matters. In the haplo where Amy Desern has done a run in, as I told you, it's given on day minus eight and day minus seven uh, ATG. And the dose what you use is 4.5 mg per kg total dose? Yeah, as I said, I don't have experience of using ATG in stem cell transplantation, but that's that's the uh, that's the dose we that's the dose it's used in other centers. Thank you, sir. Dr. Akar Chagar has a question: Any possible role of Lusputter set in severe aplastic anemia with partial response to ATG having predominantly red cell transmission dependence? <laughs> No data, don't know. You might tell me next time, next year, if you have used it, if you're able to use it, you can tell us next year if it works or not. Thank you, sir. And the last question from Dr. Babita Sodi. She has a patient who is 59 years old, PNH, diagnosed at 29 years of age, has finished therapies now on simply on folic acid 5 milligram OD, doing well, almost living normal life. Close cytometry was done recently. Minor PNH clone was identified. She has a query that spontaneous remission is mentioned in Wintrobe textbook of hematology. So whether is there any possibility of this minor clone to go into spontaneous remission? Your comment, please. Yeah, yeah, that's very well documented, not just in Wintrobe. We published recently our data on the 509 patients with PNH in blood uh, last month or something like that. Uh, spontaneous remission is seen in about 2% of patients with hemolytic PNH who are on treatment or are not on treatment. It was also reported in the 1994 NEJM paper from Peter Hillman. Uh, so it's not an effect of treatment at all, which is why your patient has gone into remission. It's a natural, uh, natural immunological phenomenon, which is why I always say PNH is a dynamic disease. It's not a static disease, which is why I always hard to give me a cutoff on PNH. What is effect? What is symptomatic? What is not? What is thrombotic? What is not type of thing? So patients do get spontaneous remission and regression and uh, this has been reported for many, 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 many years. And it's in the pre-transplant era, in the po sorry, pre-eclusimab era, post-eclusimab era, and every era as well. So it, it's just that we are keeping a patient alive. Same with your patient. You kept the patient alive just on folic acid for 30 years. So probably either there was not a large clone at diagnosis or because presumably if it's 30 years back, it probably was hamsterst. Uh, either that or they had a large clone, they did not have thrombosis and they were just compensated hemolysis and now they've slowly grown into a clonal regression or remission over a period of time. Thank you. And then the last question from Dr. Amit Kumar. Will switching from l to robuplastin in very elderly patients who has been put on cyclosporin, danazole and l non maintaining good platelet count has any role? And yeah, you can try. Of, yeah. Sorry. And what is the maximum dose of l one can use in this setting? 
I think the maximum dose of l used has been 150. The French had used 225 in some patients, very small number of patients. But personally, I've not gone beyond 150 because we are restricted because UK market is significantly restrictive on what you can use, what you can't use. So 150 is what we have used. Romiplostin, if you're asking the dose, you can go up to 20 microgram per kilogram based on the studies published from South Korea and Japan. So can you switch over to from Eltopec to Romiplostin if it's not working well with Eltopec? Like we do yeah, so, yeah. yeah, there has been uh, patients reported about four years back in leukemia, 12 patients and about 30% of patients had a response when switched from l non-response to Romiplost. Thank you, sir. And a very similar question from Dr. Sakhar. How do you how long do you continue l if only partial response at six months? Do you taper l I think you already answered that question. Well, so I have finished all the questions from the audience. Any discussion want to ask any other question to Dr. Austin? Okay. So I think, uh, yes, Dr. Radhika, please go ahead. So if we have a young, a young epilepsic anemia in 20s and 30s, who presented up front with very severe epilepsic anemia with an ANC count of around 200, less than 200, no matched sibling donor, so can an epilepsy anemia bring up this patient from such a low uh, ANC up or should I rush for a haploid identical transplant? So I think the yeah. data is, so the data is all for uh, giving ATG in the but there are pay, there are centers and we do it as well if patients are very unwell and ATG cyclosporin l thrombopag as we talked about takes time to work and if we can rapidly access a donor yeah, then we we have done 10 out of 10. And we've also done occasionally upfront urgent haploidentical transplant. But obviously, and that's the data which was published from Amy Desern and other things and people with upfront. But obviously, it's a, it's a difficult decision because uh, more so for patients who are getting infections and complications, you would go for it. But if a patient is stable and not getting admitted for complications, then you would think for going as per the as per the algorithm and protocol into ATG and cyclosporin with del is it? But again, patient is in front of you, we have to make the call, the right call at that same. Yeah. Can an ATG pull up a patient from 100 AMC count and all? Such a low AMC count. Yeah, we can. 150 something. Yeah, it can, is it? Because we know that older individuals and patients with very severe do have a less response compared to non-severes and young patients. Yeah, so that's there. But it doesn't mean to say none of the very severe aplastic anemia patients respond to ATG and cyclosporin. They do, but it's not like the 70% response seen in uh, other uh, severe or non-severe type of thing. So you need to take that into account, which is why I was telling earlier on, those patients, you will be ready with the donor. If they are landing in trouble, they're not showing a response at three, four months type of thing, you'll be ready with the donor. Thank you, Dr. Radhika. Any other discussions want to ask? Because I've finished all the questions from the audience. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a difficult decision. You would you would think aplastic anemia is an easy disease, but with only two treatments, i.e. ATG-based or transplant, but the decision between those two options is always very tricky to weigh up to, which is why I, because I'm a transplanter and also see these patients with uh, non-transplant non treatment. So it's a very, very difficult decision and something you decide based on uh, what is published, what the algorithms say, what do the guidelines say, plus the patient in front of you and pros and cons of ATG versus transplant, which is which is which is very, 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 very important to do. Thank you, sir. So I've finished all the questions from the audience and uh, there are no more raising signs. Sir, I may say you are fantastic and fabulous. What a lovely lecture and how patiently you answered all the questions. Maybe some will repeat, but you patiently answered all the questions and solved many of our doubts. Always worth listening to you. What a volume of knowledge you have in this field, sir. That speaks up here today. Thank you so much for being with us today and spending your time this Sunday for us. And I thank all of our discussions as well as audience to participate in this webinar. Thank you so much. Once again, sir, thank you so much for spending your time. I thank all the audience as well as all the discussions to participate in this webinar once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.